80 percent of area which is under irrigation and it is only because of availability of fresh water very few people know that 85 percent of fresh water is available in form of ground water not surface water and Uttar Pradesh because of Ganga, Yamuna and other important rivers it has 25 percent reserve of the ground water in the country this is the food grain production in the world it is around 3000 million tons country produces around 11 percent of that but you see Uttar Pradesh produces around 17 18 percent of the food grain of the country whereas the area under agriculture was around 11 percent we contribute almost 17 18 percent to the production and wheat is amazing like world produces 764 million tons of that around 13 percent is grown produced in the country and UP produces more than 36 percent of the wheat which is being produced in the country and we have wheat of all ranges like much depends on like baking quality wheat which needs high gluten and all that districts are separate like Sajahapur and Karai area and durum variety so whole range of wheat rice we are almost 10 percent of the country production pulses <coughs> is 11 percent productivity is one thing where we need lot of improvement and this is where we need <coughs> new technology partners new interventions the world productivity of rice is around 5.5 we are at half so lot of scope and lot of opportunities to work on that similarly wheat wheat we are better in productivity compared to rice but still we need there are there is a lot of scope sugarcane as i mentioned this is one crop where from very beginning we have been working very hard and there have been a lot of processing industries so here we are better in productivity we are better than world average and country average as well now i will show you ladies and gentlemen that in last 75 years what uttar pradesh has achieved in agriculture field as we all know area can't be expanded much there so area has remained almost same which is which was uh, during independence and but you see the area under irrigation because of major irrigation schemes and all the area under irrigation has been tripled in last 75 years you see the wheat production in 1950 it was just 2.72 million tons now it has gone to almost 41 million tons similarly rice has more than multiplied by nine times there is an increase fruit production there is a substantial increase from 4.5 million ton to 15 similarly vegetable is almost 39 million ton is the production it has almost multiplied by 3 4 times milk production there is an increase of around 16 folds and it was 2.9 now we have gone to 36 million tons and this is a sector which is which is organized in a very different fashion in india and also in Uttar Pradesh than what we see in USA and Europe. Here we have production which is totally decentralized, people with two, three milch cattle, but processing is all centralized. So rearing and production decentralized and processing centralized. This has automatically come up like this because of cooperative movement which started in this. Egg production has substantially gone up in this state. Honey, we are number one in country. Sugarcane, also we are number one in country and now it is 239 million ton. There is almost 10 times multiplication. Oil seed pulses, next. Guava again, there has been a substantial increase. Mango, we are number one in the country, it is 5.8 million tons. Potato again, Uttar Pradesh is number one and this offers lot of opportunity for increasing the processing. I have been to Rotterdam and I have seen the street foods which are mostly, I remember there is something called patak. <laughs> I used to love that, I used to love that. And But in India we need, I have been trying, I have been talking to people who are in processing that why can't we have something like that because the kind of, we call it here finger chips and all but it is not, it doesn't match it with that quality. So we are trying and working with some of the processors here who can import those technologies and it, they can make it available here. So this, this is one crop where we need lot of help from Netherlands. 
Greenpeace again we are number one with 3 million tons. These are other crops, again, again. Marshmallow meat also, UP is number one producer and exporter of meat. So all these figures which we, I showed you as a progress in last 75 years, how it adds up. You see the agriculture value from 2.2 billion which was during independence, it has gone to almost 62 billion US dollars. And life expectancy, all these are reflected and captured in this figure. It was only 36 years during independence in 1947. Now the average life expectancy is 66 years. Besides that, I will show you something about infrastructure. We are developing very fast infrastructure. We are also called the expressway Pradesh of the country. We have many good expressways and we are constructing also. We are also constructing the largest airport of Asia in Java. So we have good network of rail and road. Next. We have initiated reforms in sector of setting up industries and processing. So single window and all. So this will ensure that any investor who is coming for process setting up industry or any technology driven thing in agriculture and horticulture, we will be there to help and support him. I will close my presentation by showing some areas where we are sincerely <coughs> looking for help and expertise of Netherlands. And I'm quite sure with the presence of Excellency here, we will be able to persuade and negotiate with you to come and set up your plant and set up your institutions in state of Uttar Pradesh. Thank you. Namaskar. Indeed, uh, we would like to offer you a... Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, you mentioned Mr. Aghi, for example, is a company working together with you, also with UP. Box, and I know it's working, you mentioned the sugar industry. So the Dutch are there, and as the ambassador mentioned, um, 11 companies will be visiting the group now, also meeting with you, exactly for the reasons that you just mentioned. The opportunities that we see in the vegetable sector, in the horticulture, protected cultivation, um, and the good economic atmosphere that exists. So thank you very much, thank you for sharing this. Um, we now, if you mentioned Rotterdam, so nice to you. Um, because uh, Kareen Eigenkamp, uh, Rotterdam, uh, Innovation Quarter, as I said, involved. And then, at least for those who don't know the map of the Netherlands, uh, Rotterdam is in the southwest part of the Netherlands. Uh, and I'm mentioning this because it's part of this <coughs> region which we I would call the, the glass city. Uh, it's where the greenhouses are. That's also the reason why she is connected, amongst others, with the greenhouse delta and with uh, those working in the greenhouse sector. Karina, I would like you to offer you the floor and tell us a little bit about Rotterdam Innovation Board. Thank you. Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, uh, well, I'm very honored to represent Innovation Border and Rotterdam Partners here today. And Mr. Kumasin, I'm very honored also to hear that you've been visiting the beautiful city of Rotterdam, which is always great to hear. Um, well, I'm, I'm excited to take you along in uh, the work that we do, so I will tell you a bit more about that. Um, Innovation Quarter is the regional development agency of the Greater Rotterdam, the Hague area, which basically means that everything we do is focused on strengthening the regional economy. And Rotterdam Partners is doing exactly the same, but with a stronger focus on the city of Rotterdam, of course. So both organizations really drive growth, um, focused on uh, the regional economy and all industries that are essential to the economic transition that we are in. Um, and we really focus on metropolitan ambitions that you are sure familiar with here in India. So we focus on innovation, digitalization, uh, sustainability, circularity, and also inclusiveness, of course. 
And these topics are really leading for our commitment. And this also means that both organizations really operate at the crossroads of either regional development and international collaboration. And our commitment, commitment is basically threefold. So first, we nurture local innovative businesses. We really foster an ecosystem of growth in sectors like, for example, maritime, which is very important for the city of Rotterdam. Michiel already mentioned it being the gateway to Europe, but also in industries like energy, chemistry, uh, technology, cybersecurity, high tech, and also very important <coughs> horticulture, because that's what brings us here today. And we really believe that local enterprises are essential to the region, uh, to the region's economic vitality. Um, next to that, we also assist foreign companies that seek to establish themselves in our unique Delta region. So we, uh, we strategically integrate them within our ecosystem and we're really trying to create an environment in which both local and international enterprises can thrive together and strengthen each other. Um, but thirdly, I think our strength also really lies in being an impact investor. So we have 300 million euros uh, in funds under management and that really enables us to uh, invest in and to support these local enterprises. And beyond investing in these companies, uh, we also help these portfolio companies in scaling up and expand their business internationally. And we do that by our internationalization programs. And that's the reason why we also very strongly focus on optimizing the international expansion journey for our local companies. And our approach really uh, involves orchestrating focused trade missions, like we also do here in India. Um, and these trade missions are really focused on a specific cluster uh, of companies operating uh, in the same, uh, for, for the same goal. And we, we're really trying to ease their access to new global markets. So we introduce them to the relevant uh, international net networks all aimed to preparing these companies in taking the next few steps in our international expansion. And I think as a testament to this commitment, you find us here today and participating in the Netherlands Pavilion here at the World Food India. Um, and today we are basically here as part of the, uh, the Dutch program, the NL Horty Road to India. And well, I'm honored to have the opportunity here to tell you a bit more about this super interesting and dynamic program. Um, it's a three-year program that really seeks synergy between businesses, the government, and educational institutions, meaning that this is a public-private partnership, meaning that we are backed and supported by the government. Um, and I think what's really special about this project is that we have a committed cluster of 11 companies so 11 companies that are active in the horticulture industry that have expensive, uh, sorry, extensive experience in the horticulture industry. They have been building projects all over the world in every kind of climate from minus 40 to plus 40 and they really work together. And that's what we also aim for here in India. So we're aiming to work together with Indian stakeholders to really drive the Indian horticulture sector to the next level. And I think the annual Horty Road to India cluster really represents the strength of the Dutch horticulture industry, as it really covers the entire value chain. So we have companies like we have uh, logistic companies based in the port of Rotterdam, but also it varies to uh, a seed company who's focusing on developing seeds, but still tailored to local needs. Uh, we have greenhouse builders using the newest and most sustainable technology. Um, and these companies really complement each other. So we work together on one solution for global challenges, but still tailored to local needs and local circumstances. And I think that's very important. And together with our great partner Dutch Greenhouse Delta, we are really seeking these collaborations with Indian counterparts, so to work together in a way that really fits the Indian context 
and it further drives the Indian horticulture industry. And, well, lastly, but very important, we do all this by uh, a fork to farm approach, meaning that our starting point is basically the end of the chain. So we really look at demand. Where is demand going? What are the trends in this demand? And who's tapping into this demand? And uh, we see a great potential in the growing demand in India for sustainable, pesticide-free, year-round production of fruits and vegetables. And together with retailers, investors, the hospitality sector, but of course also with growers that are well looking for new technologies, we aim to work towards a profitable business case. And we really believe that there is a profitable business case for high-tech horticulture here in India. And we really wish to take you along in this journey. So Thank you for your attention and we are very much looking forward to discussing collaborative opportunities together with you. Thank you, Karim. Okay, thank you. If I, if I remember well, please correct me if I'm wrong, but otherwise it was one of your public organizations. Um, I think Innovation Board has also offered a soft landing platform for Indian innovative companies, including agricultural companies, to the Netherlands, because that's another interesting fact, I think, of the Netherlands, and also about Rotterdam, is that it is a landing platform for many, many Indian companies wishing to enter the European market. It's one European market, but the best entry is through the Netherlands. So, uh, uh, sorry, I'm always doing a little bit of promotion. Uh, as I said, I was already very proud of Wageningen, uh, a fantastic cluster around the university, companies being there, companies working together with the university. Um, so I'm very happy to have you here, Kalyan. Uh, and I'm not going to have to try, he at least tried to pronounce your last name. I'm not even doing that, Kalyan. So Kalyan, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Esteemed uh, speakers, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, it's such a privilege uh, to be here to share some ideas about uh, the emerging challenges uh, which especially are affecting food security in countries like India. But I think it's a global uh, trend now. We are facing some unforeseen, either to unforeseen challenges, especially ever since uh, the pandemic, geopolitics, extreme weather events, etc. So I'll cover a few, uh, there are some <coughs> key uh, points I'd like to bring forth. But before I do that, I'd also like to uh, share a little bit about Wageningen University and Research been mentioned a lot. I feel uh, uh, proud, but at the same time also a little humbled you know, with, with the kind of reputation this uh, institute uh, has built over the years, more than a century. Yeah, it's, it's been celebrated as centenary year in 2018. It's more than 105 years old. But uh, the story of Bargaining and is really the story of how Netherlands uh, has emerged as a superpower, I think, uh, in the world, because Bargaining has contributed uh, a lot in that world. So for those of you who are still not uh, aware, for one thing the pronunciation, like my last name, is very difficult. Uh, it's Bachening in University and Research. <laughs> so I am still practicing. Uh, it is actually a culmination of two legal entities. Uh, it's very <coughs> unique in that way. You have Bachening University, which is a separate legal entity. We have about 13,000 students. We have about 200 professors uh, you know, organized in 95 chair groups. <coughs> where we carry out uh, all kinds of uh, fundamental research concerning sustainable food production and its interaction with the environment. But we also have uh, Wageningen and Research, which is a separate legal entity. Uh, they are both together as one uh, offering you know, to the external world because we have a common governance structure. So we have uh, one board, external board, a governing board, and also some corporate staff like myself, which are responsible for the whole of the institution or the organization as a whole. So in Wageningen and University, I mentioned we carry out basic research, fundamental research, to tackle some long-term uh, challenges. Like for instance, we have a project now to increase the photosynthesis uh, efficiency of plants, which is only at 1%. Sometimes in C4 plants, it's up to 2%. But we want to bring it to 6%. You know. So suddenly you're not just looking at 250 million tons, but just by increasing the efficiency of photosynthesis of plants. 
you're going to increase it like three times and not doing anything else. So that is a classic example of fundamental research that we do. There's no strict timelines because it's really path breaking and, and it, it has to, uh, to do with a lot of multidisciplinary approaches you know, which we follow. But on the other hand, we have these nine specialized research institutes which work as independent uh, you know, organizations to collaborate with especially the private sector to come up with very applied uh, uh, innovations. You know. So it's very applied research, very need-based, and I'll just spell out these uh, nine research institutes you know, because some of you could be interested in that. You start with marketing and plant research, where the focus is mostly on sustainable intensification, which means you know we're focused on increasing the productivity. <coughs> talk of glass houses, greenhouses. So the focus is on uh, protected cultivation. Uh, the second is marketing and livestock research. Think about dairy. Think about poultry. Think about aquaculture. So how to develop very efficient production systems, management systems, all the protocols developed there. We also have bargaining and bio-veterinary research, which is to do with disease management of animals. We also develop vaccines in that. We have a, a social sciences group, which is not normal for agriculture and food university. So we have a, a two specialized institutes. One is called bargaining and economic research. We are very active in many countries. Bargaining and economic research conducts feasibility studies. We prepare business plans looking at both the macro situation, supply chains, trade, but also the local strengths of provinces, countries. We have Center for Development Innovation, which is into capacity building and training, one of the main need gaps that is like India. So we do very tailor-made programs there. And we have environment and environment research. So and the focus is on what, you know, what climate is doing to production in general, both for plants and animals and how to deal with the, the challenges that climate systems pose. So, this in general is, uh, in a nutshell, about why There's a lot more to share, but for paucity of time, I'll stop there. If you are interested to know more about Vagami, please approach me. I'll be here uh, in the pavilion later. And now I come to the key messages that I want to share with you today. A lot of it also has been covered by my fellow speakers. It's always a challenge to be the last one to speak <laughs> and find something new to speak about. But yeah, I think uh, in India, uh, I was there in the first edition of the World Food uh, India in 2018. It's already been five years. But I relocated to the Netherlands already in 2013, so it's been 10 years. And I already see a lot of new things here, new challenges, new opportunities, but also challenges. Uh, the first one I'd like to say is on the demand side. So if you see what is happening because of increasing urbanization, uh, increasing income levels, I think, and also internationalization, uh, the main thing that you see is the consumer discern for not only sensory attributes, such as taste, texture, variety, but also for non-sensory attributes, such as safety, nutrition, so the consumers are increasingly uh, changing towards uh, a high-value diet. And, and I think that is a trend which is uh, seen now increasingly penetrate in two cities as well. So I think we should be very aware that while the demand side is consolidating, it's good opportunity for people to intervene, but you should also understand that their, their, their preferences and tastes and discern is very fast changing. So that is the first trend I think we should be aware of. The second trend is what the macro environment is uh, uh, shaping, I would say. You know, uh, with the twin challenges of uh, climate change, we see increased manifestations of extreme weather events. As we speak, you know, one area we're witnessing drought, the other area there will be flash floods. So this is increasing at a very frequent rate, uh, as the uh, scientists predicted. But also, the silent killer is what already uh, Ralph mentioned, which is the biodiversity erosion. You know, there was this alarming uh, report that FAO published in 2021. I don't know if some of you had a chance to go through it. I'm calling it a silent time bomb because at least for climate change, you see the manifestations. But for biodiversity loss, we are all not aware that every day we are losing at least two to 300 species. They're becoming extinct. 
And nobody knows how it is going to affect uh, the food system, and the ecological balance, because there are some keystone players in ecosystems. If one species is kicked out, and that will not be like an apex, you know, predator or you know, top of the food chain. It can be with a small insect or a small fungus in the soil <laughs> that you don't see. But if they are kicked out, then it will be catastrophic. There will be new pests, new diseases, new outbreaks. You know, it can affect soil pH. You know, you can't grow. Uh, for, the forests are thriving now. So these are all. It is not just a fear of unknown, but through uh, very very detailed assessments, FAO said, if we don't take measures to stop the biodiversity loss by 2070, it will be a downhill. It will be very difficult uh, to actually do anything about it. It will be a, a catastrophe. You know, there will be uh, big food security issues. So these are the, uh, this is the big macro challenge uh, that we are encountering. And unfortunately, uh, in the Western world, there are measures being taken, but most of the problem uh, is, is rampant in countries in the southern hemisphere where the biodiversity is more. You know, take Mexico, take India, take countries in Africa, Southeast Asia. This is where you know, most of the biodiversity erosion is happening because again, agriculture is the main culprit. Extensive farming is the main culprit. Uh, the third challenge, I think this has also been covered extensively by Ralph, uh, is food losses and food waste. Well, in India, food loss used to be more the quantity loss in the supply chain. But I think what we're seeing now is the quality loss. And the main uh, problem there is because of uh, the infrastructure, the infrastructure we have for handling, you know, and storing and distributing food. It's not so much a production problem. But the new trend I'd like to share with you is food wastage is different from food loss. Food loss is something which happens in the supply chain because quantity or quality losses or leakages in the system. Or, or store grade plastics or diseases. But food waste is really a worse enemy because it is wasted on the plate. You know? Food which is supposed to have been consumed is discarded or thrown. That used to be not the case in India before, but now in cities, this is a big, big challenge. You know, it is happening very rapidly, both in our primary surveys as well as in our secondary surveys we found. But this is a big, big enemy challenge. We have this big fat Indian weddings. Maybe 60% of the food is thrown. Same with horeca chains. Most of the restaurants are just thrown food. So it is a catastrophic loss again. I think that, that is something which uh, is, a, is a trend. <laughs> Unfortunately, not a good one. The last uh, and probably one of the most uh, significant change which is happening, also as a result of urbanization, is the migration uh, of uh, population. It's a one-way traffic, and, and what happens because of uh, even young workforce trying to find jobs in the cities is that there is no uh, skilled manpower anymore available to do the mundane jobs in peri-urban and also rural areas where most of the food processing activities take place. So this is another challenge. I'm sure sir, you would have seen that in UP as well. So the biggest challenge today for the industry, or even for landlords, is labor. You know, it's not so much the other inputs. Uh, two minutes more? One and a half. Okay. <laughs> so, the question is, what can we do about it? You know, what can we do about these challenges? I think the first is, we need to be sensitive to the consumers. We have to see how their preferences are changing, and we have to reassess and reorganize ourselves to meet the demands of the changing urban consumers, which is going to be the majority very soon. Already it is close to 50%, but I think the next decade will be more urban than rural. The second is we need to come up with more resource use and efficient circular production and processing systems, because I think because of climate change, the resources will definitely be even more constrained. The third is we need to develop smart agro logistics systems. You know, and that is, I think what made Netherlands great is actually the smart agro logistics in Rotterdam, you know, the port and also the peripheral network and infrastructure that are seen, seamlessly developed. And uh, last but not least, we need to start thinking about automation, you know, it's especially grading, sorting, you know, which takes hours and is very laborious. Nobody is going to uh, be available to do counting of fruits or seeing the color, and you have to really come up with automation for that. Think robotics, uh, things hyperspectral imaging, but all this is there. And the good news is, Magnum is there to 
uh, yeah, to be, uh, we are very keen. Uh, India has been identified as a foremost country, at least in my portfolio in Asia. So I'm very keen to collaborate and uh, help make these, uh, address these challenges that we talk about. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you for giving this insight. I was happy to learn the first time actually about the divisions in Bach and University. And okay, pronunciation might be difficult. You made it easy by saying the verb. You have the V W V U R, uh, and I'm always amazed about actually the fact how many Indians I meet that can pronounce Wageningen. I'm, I'm, I'm good with Wageningen, so I'm very happy with that. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> as usual, uh, we don't have, unfortunately or fortunately, we are going to open our pavilion. We are waiting for the secretary of Mofki, which is a big honor to have the secretary to open together with the ambassador and Mr. Manoj Kumar Singh, if you would be there, we would love to have you also for the opening of the of our pavilion. Of course, you are all invited to come to this opening of the pavilion. We are very proud of it. It's a, a meeting point mainly. It, it's not a sales point. It's a meeting point. Of course, we hope that sales come out of the meetings. That's fine. Um, but I would like to invite you to the opening. Uh, we won't have time for any questions now, also because I'm talking much too much. But um, we will be in the pavilion to make all these speeches. So once more, a warm and warm applause for these fantastic audience. Thank you very much. And please, a big warm thanks also to the organizers. Thank you. Thank you. for being a great moderator for the session. I would like to express my gratitude to esteemed speakers and audience with whom, without whom the session would not have been possible. Now I request Mr. Lukul to present a small gift to our distinguished guest. Mr. Lukul, please.